So the, the, that's great to hear that, uh, how that evolved in the discovery process. Um, there, as you uh, produce so many documentaries, Rainey, um, you, you'll, you'll know that this is an unusual form, uh, the, for Sama is an unusual one in that it doesn't have um, the trappings of a typical documentary, which would give you some of the history of Aleppo, would tell you why uh, Assad was such a bad guy, would talk about the political situation that was going on, um, uh, would talk more about the outside world response, would give you some of that context. But instead, this starts right in the middle of like, you're in a hospital, something's getting, it's getting bombed, there's, um, there's a baby, and like, you don't really know what's going on. Um, and it's so, um, in, in a good sense of the word, claustrophobic in the sense that you're so in tight on, on, on this story, this hospital, this child. Um, and, and only sometimes do you get, um, or every once in a while, you, you, you sort of lift up and see the city, um, those beautiful long shots of the city just being um, destroyed by, uh, by, by bombing and you realize where you are. But, um, it, it's uh, it's a, just a different kind of documentary uh, for me. Yeah, I mean, I think for Frontline, I mean, certainly we've told stories all sorts of different ways out of Syria, right? As Wad mentioned, a lot of foreign journalists were in Syria trying to tell these stories. And boy, did we try. And I think that's important journalism, too. I think that's where we took comfort, that this isn't the only story that we're telling out of Syria and out of the Middle East, right? This isn't the only type of journalism we're telling. But I've been thinking deeply about how and why her film broke through. And I think it's because it really didn't have that wall that you're used to with the foreign correspondent. It had the actual experience of the people living it so people could relate to it more. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, and as a woman and mother myself, I heard in crowds of people, people just crowding around Wad, hugging her, wanting to be close to her because they could relate so much to her story, right? As either a mother, or an aunt or whatever it was that they were feeling at the time. And I think there was a feeling that there was a convening around this human story that then allowed people in the West to see what was happening in Syria in a new way. And I reckon that that's journalism too, right? So that's it, that is journalism. And I've been thinking about what Peter would think of this and you know his tradition of journalism, he would have looked at this and just thought, my God, that is the most original story out of Syria that we can tell. As Western journalists, you know, we can help tell. So it's been kind of an amazing expansion also for Frontline and Storyform that I think we're, we're looking at for the future. How can we find local journalists to tell their own stories? It used to be that we would work with somebody who is a local journalist more in the advising us stage, right? And, and that's something that we're evolving around too. I think many news organizations are. And here's the best example of that. Do you like the term citizen journalism or is, or is that or not? Yeah, I like it. I like it because it gives me like kind of space to, to express myself and to tell my own opinion and to say something maybe in the normal journalism, like people doesn't want to like say because that's more responsibility. And I think, I mean, personally, I, 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 I consider myself like an activist before I be a filmmaker. And everything I did in for Sama was kind of that activism. On the other hand, of course, I mean, I'm also like a filmmaker, but as a filmmaker, there's kind of responsibility more to take a step back. And I wasn't able to do that in, in for Sama. And I think what Rainy like just mentioned, it's very important because it gives like people, the people who like, this is their story. You know, when we go even like myself to go to report from any place now, I mean, we have to tell like to, to, to make these characters or like people part of that story, not just like film them and go alone in our like edit and do what, what we think about them. They should be part of this. They should be involved in that, uh, in their story at least, you know? And that's actually the least we can do to make uh, this story more honest and more true and more like, uh, just like purely uh, story. We had this discussion among the judges about Oh, Robert, do you mind just, just one little caveat I have there as, as she was speaking? I wanted to mention something really important about films like WADS is if they still go through the same editorial process with a news organization like Frontline or Channel 4 News, right? And Channel 4 for that matter. So we're still vetting every single scene that you see. When we see a bomb and we can't trace it exactly to Russia, we're not saying Russia did that, right? So there are a lot of discussions in that about how do we create like 
you know, the scenes that we're seeing, but also journalism around it in those moments. So it's applying journalism to this new form. It's really interesting. I mean, it, it's an important effort because then personal stories you can say are vetted and true too. Right. So I, I, it's, just a, it's a good thing to do. I'm glad you interjected. We had a discussion uh, among the judges at, uh, when we were looking at this about <clears throat> whether uh, something can be both activism and journalism at the same time. And um, uh, it was an interesting discussion when we decided, yes, it can be. I mean, it is an expansion of, of the definition and the boundaries of how we traditionally look at journalism. But I, I think you're right. I mean, you can't just th throw away all standards and, uh, and uh, 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 questions about truth telling um, that, uh, that, you know, that, that come into play. Uh, what I want to ask you about a couple of moments in the film that struck me um, uh, as particularly dramatic. Um, one was when um, you leave Aleppo and go to Turkey to visit uh, um, your husband's uh, family and then um, come back. And um, you, t you, you introduced the idea of like, was that the right decision to come back or not? Um, uh, you've got a baby, um, you've got, uh, you, you're deciding to go back into a, a, a clear danger zone. Um, and I just, can you talk a little bit more about the sort of the, the, the thought process that you had about whether to stay or to flee, not just at that moment, but at any time. I mean, that must've been constantly on your mind, yes? Yeah, I mean, I've tried so hard through making the film to find an answer and like say to people like, yeah, why I decided this or how we decided this. But then it was really complicated thing to explain. And I felt at the end, like the only way, which I will be really honest with people is to say that like, I don't know why I did that. There's something like just given us like that thing that we have to do this. And this is the only thing right we have to do. And I mean, like later I can, maybe now when I'm thinking back at that moment and start to like analyze why we did this and how we did it. I mean, Hamza is a doctor and his job there is very important. His work is really making difference in that situation. Me as a journalist who like has a camera and I'm able like to uh, give uh, people who, who are there a platform and take uh, their stories and make it out. And that's what I was doing through Channel 4 News. And also like both of us as family with Sama also, I mean, we weren't going like to a battle where there's a front line and just stuff, like a fight. People are, uh, people like Aleppo as a city is like full of people, full of families. And you can see that through like the whole scenes of the film. So we were just like doing what we have to do as a family and as individuals. And I think because we lived through that for five years, we know these people so much like they were even like for us in, in one position or not like more than uh, what we lived with our families. So we felt like this is part of the responsibility toward this community, not to like turn our back and like don't look at them. And, you know, like it's so hard and really so far to explain even and to describe. But I think, I mean, whatever it could have been happened at that time. But I mean, I will never regret that decision at all. Thank you. Um, there's a scene in the movie where um, you're filming uh, after an attack and uh, there's a, uh, a child who has been uh, injured or killed, I'm not sure, um, and a woman who is presumably her mother uh, starts screaming and at one point she says, are you filming this? Um, was she objecting to your filming it? Yeah, so I mean, when I was filming that, I also thought I was confused also about why she's shouting at me in this time. And I mean, obviously for me was at that time that yeah, she's shouting for me to stop filming because she's like going through something very hard at that moment. And like automatically I turned my camera like down a little bit until I heard her again, like begging me again to keep filming and asking me like to keep filming so the whole world could see what's happening. Oh, she wanted you to keep filming. Yeah, and that's confusion. I think yeah, like right. some people like felt it, but I mean, if if you uh, are able like to go back to that scene again, that will be like very clear again when, when you see this. But I put it as it is exactly because for me it was very important that confusion with, with, with all of us. I mean, even myself behind the camera, there was so many times when I felt like in one second, this is very important to be like filmed 
But after like one second, I was feeling like, what the point of this? This will be just like an additional footage. The world will not do anything for this. So that struggle was all the time between like the people who, who are living in that situation. But did you have um, other situations where, where uh, people d objected to your, your filming because it was so private or emotional? I mean, you were in a situation where you in a hospital where um, uh, people are, are very emotional. And um, yeah. I can imagine that some of them would not want to be filmed. Did that happen a lot or how did you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, it's happening usually. And I mean, I don't know if it's a lot or not a lot, but usually like when you when you are in that situation, like for me, because I was quite like well known in Aleppo as like I was living in that hospital for a couple of years. People from the community and the neighborhood, they know us all, like even by names. So, I mean, when, when you when people come in a massacre or something like this, you can see that through people's faces, like when, like they, 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 there's camera or something, they like turn their back or they don't want to like look at you or something. And you can see also like through people's eyes when they want you to come and they want just to talk or to, 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 do, to do something. And I mean, in both ways, as I just mentioned, like there, there was that struggle all the time. Like same people who they might want to be filmed today, they feel tomorrow like why I'm being also filmed today. No one will do anything. The world is watching this. The world is numb about this and they are fine with all of this.